sorry, as he started um, as a teacher in elementary school before graduating in educational science. He started his research on learning technologies in uh, 1984 and was one of the first in the world to apply machine learning to develop a self-improving teaching system as early as 1986. He obtained his PhD in computer science from the University of Leinster in the domain of uh, artificial intelligence applications for education. After some time at Université de Genève, he joined EPFL in 2002 and has been there since, currently serving as the Associate Vice President for Education. Before that, as the Academic Director of the Center of Digital Education, he worked on implementing the MOOC strategy of EPFL, a pretty significant MOOC platform with over 2 million registrations. Today, he is a full professor in learning technologies in the School of Computers and Communication Science and head of the Chile Lab, which stands for Computer Human Interaction for Learning and Instruction. He's the director of the Leading House Dual T, which develops technologies for dual vocational education systems, such as carpenters or florists. So maybe Dual T could have helped us in our decoration of Gaza Town. With uh, EPFL colleagues, he launched in 2017 the Swiss EdTech Collider, which is an incubator with 80 startups in learning technologies. He's himself quite familiar with startups as the co founder of four of them and a member of the world of several companies or institutions. In 2018, he co-founded LEARN, the EPFL Center of Learning Sciences that brings together the local initiatives in educational innovation. He is a fellow of the International Society for Learning Sciences. I had the pleasure to, of meeting Pierre at Ectel um, five years ago, and he gave a very lively keynote, my best moment of the conference. I wish you could all meet him in person as besides his impressive curriculum, he's a kind guy with a great sense of humor but we are already delighted to have you here, Pierre. So please join me to welcome Professor Pierre Delambourg to talk about the classroom is the system. Good. Can you see my slide? Yeah. Yes, we do. So good morning or good afternoon and thank you for the invitation and, and um, hello to the people I know. I've seen Vanda, I've seen Jade online and special hello to Paola who is supporting the Belgian team. I've seen that in the, in the chat. So. Um, so my, my idea quite often is that a good keynote should be a, a single ID. And, um, but it should not be a ridiculous ID. It should not be a stupid ID. And this is really the most stupid ID I've produced. Thinking about the classroom as a digital system. Why is it stupid? Because everything is a system. An, an apple is a system, a bird is a system, my left foot is a system, my car is a system, everything is a system. So what does it buy us to call a classroom a system? That's what I am. I will try to, to demonstrate today. And I start from a concrete example of a colleague who had very bad teaching evaluation. And I said, okay, I will come and look at your class. And um, he was in a situation not as bad as on this picture, but it was basically looking at the students in the first row, you know, the good students, those who follow you like that. And he completely lost the rest of the classroom and he did not even notice that. A good teacher quite often lose the attention of his students, but he noticed it. And then he makes a joke or he may say, um, ladies and gentlemen, this might be a question for the exam. And then he got back the attention of his class. But this teacher did not perceive the attention of his, of his that he was losing the attention and he did not react. So I thought maybe we, I can give him an indicator or something that vibrates in his pocket, telling me, telling him, oh, beware, maybe, you know, you lost 90% of your students. No, some, some prosthesis for beginning teachers or for bad teachers. And uh, we did so. So we put webcams, uh, not webcam, sorry, high resolution cameras in front of the classes. And we did machine learning, of course, the ground truth was kind of subjective to ground truth. We stopped the class every 15 minutes and we asked students, how much did you pay attention? How much did your neighbor pay attention? And then we, 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 we do the computer vision algorithm on that. And the result was not the face of the students because students learn for years and years to fake attention. They're extremely talented at looking at you like that, and they're already thinking about the weekend. So it's what was predictive of attention was the fact, the fact that the head rotates, rotate, the heads rotate at the same time, the co-rotation of the head. 
Why? Because the reason why heads of students rotate is because the teacher is moving. So, and that's why it's important as a teacher to move. So that was a, the predictive factor. And so that's an example of, of, of a system that I will reuse in the past, in the next things. So we will say, Pierre, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you going, to really, do you really want to put cameras in classes, in classrooms? And um, for a while I said, yeah, we can put cameras that don't take any picture. Cameras that compute in real time the co-rotation of the heads. But after a while, I decided, no, we should simply not bring cameras in class in the classroom, because if we do it with good intention, somebody else will do something else with the data. So let me take a second example now. Uh, no, maybe ask a second question you could ask me. But Pierre, is the goal of the technology to improve the lecture? Like this, this guy was not lecturing well, so you might, with such a technology, improve his lecturing. Or is it rather the, the goal to stop lecturing and to replace lecturing by more constructivist approach? And on the right is, on the left is a traditional TED talk where the teacher makes a show. Is that the goal? On the right is Jean Piaget, the founder of constructivism. So um, let me take a second example. Look at this video. This is an exercise session. Physics 101, the killing class. Many students will fail. On the right, you have the TA. And on the bottom left, you have two, on the left, you have two students. One is walking while waiting, one is doing nothing. And when the TA is available, where will she go? She will go to the um, one that was doing nothing because he grabbed her. So we, we did a study and what we found is that when they're waiting during this very difficult exercise session of physics 101, Student wasted 62% of the time doing nothing, just waiting to grab the TA. So we designed this device. I don't know, can you see it still? So this is called a lantern. The color of the lantern tell which exercise we are doing. Why? Because if, I, if I'm on exercise five, everybody is on one, I can wait a little bit. So exercise one, two, three. Now the number of LEDs tell the TA how much I've been working on exercise two, three. Because if I've been working for two minutes, I may be trying more before to call the TA. And that's it. And when I need help, I push on it and uh, it will start blinking slowly and then faster and faster. It's a very stupid technology. So as you see on the picture on the top, they just display this on the table. This is a dashboard. This is called a dashboard, a distributed dashboard, but this is a dashboard for the, for the teacher. And you see that the wasted time went down from 62 to 6%. Okay. Stupid technology, but very effective. And um, that's my second example. That's my two examples of that motivates the reason to call this classroom a digital system. So, you know, learning analytics usually is, is thinking about the box. The box is a computer or an iPhone, but it's, it's, it's a box. And I'm talking, I want to expand that. I don't want to create a new field. I want to expand learning analytics, that's my suggestion today, to another box. Basically, a cl classroom usually is, is a kind of a box with people inside. The difference is that in learning analytics, the unit is the knowledge state of an individual students, while in the classroom analytics is more end students, is the class, the entire class. Maybe it's not their knowledge, maybe it's just the activity level. The second main difference is that in learning analytics, usually the, the information, the model, the modeling is done for the system to decide to adapt the instruction except in the case of open student models. And for classroom analytics, the, the model is more open. The model is more there to help the teacher to take a decision, not to system to decide for the teacher. There is a human in the loop. So basically, if my classroom is a digital environment and there is an input and output and some processing in, in between, input are in sensors, output are actuators, so what are there? Well, any kid in the classroom has a phone with a lot of sensors. You can buy hundreds of different other sensors. So the 
the, the range of what can be captured in a classroom is huge. Output, the actuators is basically dashboard. Uh, we have, um, no, there is no platform anywhere today that has no uh, dashboard. Most of them are just too complex. Most of them, while they're supposed to decrease the cognitive load of the teacher, they're so rich in information that they actually increase the cognitive load of the teacher. So um, we should be very minimalist in terms of dashboard. Um, the, so basically, the input is the classroom data and the output is some data visualization. Okay, that's one example. And the role of this data visualization is to help the teacher to monitor the classroom and to decide to intervene. The processing between the input and the output is some aggregation, synthesis, comparison of data, and so on. Nothing very smart. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the lantern is a, is a dashboard, but distributed. We did experiment with exactly the same information on a centralized way. So one dashboard for the teacher, it works as well. It reduces also the wasted time, but it was more like a, a, um, a game board, a scoreboard of a game. And I, especially boys in, in the in the classes really wanted to be number one because when it was on a, on a centralized dashboard. Um, it can be in real time, uh, like on the upper video, you see the, uh, well, we don't see much, the real, the teacher sees the screen of every learner, or it can be a replay, like in the bottom win video, you see the level of attention of the students in my class. It can be focal, it can be on the laptop of the teacher, it can be peripheral. It could be some very small indicator embedded in the wall. It can be public, like the teacher use a dashboard, I will come back on this example. The teacher use a dashboard publicly to discuss with the students, or it can be private. He doesn't want to show that the learner is struggling, so he prefers to work with his iPad across the class. Uh, or it can be, it can be, um, um, on headset, uh, probably you know this video from Ken Olstein, where actually the, the teacher is working in the class with his headset and he sees which student is active, which student is doing something else, which student is going well. So different ways of displaying uh, the state of the classroom to the teacher. Then the input may be the, state, the activity of the students. The input can also be the activity of the teacher. Like in this case, where you see the red dots, the, the green dots for the position of the learners in a, in a chemistry lab, and the green dots, the red dots, sorry, are the movement of the teacher. You see that teacher kind of completely neglects some sub area of this classroom. So helping the teacher to reflect by showing his own data. That's another one done by Luis Prieto. Again, the position of the teacher uh, in two different classrooms, same configuration, but two different students. And he, he has some corners that he seems to neglect. That's another one done by, by Luis Prieto, where we, we record data from the teacher and try to extract his teacher activity on two levels when he's working with the entire class or with small groups. So extracting data from the students, extracting data from the teachers or from both. Here, he asked the teachers to predict the level of the, the understanding level of the kids and he has the same question to the kids and he compares the teacher prediction in yellow to the students self-assessment in blue or the other way around. That's another one that done by the team of um, um, Hati who wrote this book, The Visible, Visible Learning, they developed visible classroom where you see how much, for instance, uh, the teacher has been speaking and the number of words per minute, you know, helping the teachers to speak less and less fast. So analytics for helping the student to manage, the teacher to manage a classroom. And what are the functions? We see one is the teacher knows what's going on, he adapts and so on. There are some classroom, some other functionalities I want to stress, especially going in the more constructivist side. And I take an example from my research on carpenters. You know, vocational education is the, is the DNA of Switzerland. Two-thirds of teenagers learn a job when they're 16, including our president who, 
who met Putin and Biden last week. And um, he, the teacher of Carpenter said, well, listen, Pierre, we have a problem. We need to shoot static, the propagation of force in a beam structure to these kids. We have three hours. At the PFL, you take two years to train civil engineers, engineers to do so, and we cannot use mathematics. So can you help us? So the solution was this kind of augmented reality systems where we make the forces visible in a roof structure. Here is a short video. So you see the roof structure, you, the spring um, indicate whether the beam are being in compression or in extension. And the, the learner can put weights on the roof like a solar panel or snow, because snow melts more slowly and no pains of the roof. So it makes some disequilibrium. And here you see a little bit closer. Now there's 23% compression on the left, but only 17 on the right. And um, then you might say, well, what? then maybe if I want to put a jacuzzi in my ceiling, I should probably uh, uh, consider uh, buying more expensive beams, uh, more expensive wood that will resist to stronger pressure and so on and so on. The reason I show this, this augmented reality stuff is to ask you, do you believe that playing with this, any student, whether it's an apprentice or an EPFL student, will discover the laws of Newton or whatever? No. The, the idea of, of constructivism is, 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 um, is a very naive idea. Um, it's, um, I like to talk about semi-constructivism or, or the way Dan Schwartz called it, um, there is a time for telling. What I mean is that they can play with a simulation for many hours, they will not discover, or maybe one, but there is no haha, eureka, whatever, but they are ready to, to learn. They are ready to listen what the professor, after trying, they kind of feel it makes sense, they don't get it, but it's kind of, it's a bit there, and then, a lecture is very effective at this moment. And, and the, the, the classroom as a system has a role to play in this transition between the exploration phase and the debriefing phase, between exploring and the lecture. And this role is that if the lecture comes like that, totally independent from what they have done, that, that doesn't work. The lecture has to be built, has to build upon what they've produced during the exploration phase. And I will show that with a second example. Um, uh, or oh, that's some research from Manu Kapoor. He called that productive failure, but that's a bit the same idea. He let them explore. And then there is um, a lecture on standard deviation. At the end of the post-test, uh, productive failure is so it's, it's the method I've I have described exploration followed by lecture. Direct instruction in blue is the opposite. They don't differ in terms of the ability to compute standard deviation, but there is a significant difference in terms of conceptual understanding, the meaning of this concept. Why do we need this concept and transfer? So the role of the technology there is to collect the production of the kids during the lecture to be able to use them in debriefing. And here is a second example, still for vocational education. These are apprentices in logistics. They work in a warehouse. And they have to learn logistics, which is very abstract. These are not like carpenters. Carpenters are brilliant apprentices. Logistic people, they move boxes in a warehouse. You know, that's not the most. And they fail everything at school, everything with an X. Physics, mathematics, statistics. So you come with, with logistics, the teacher told us it's so difficult to teach them. So we designed this technology, a still augmented reality, where they build a warehouse by concretely, these are very physical guys. So they put, uh, this is my warehouse where the trucks, this is where the trucks arrive and leave. And I build a warehouse by putting, placing plastic shelves on the table. Oh, you see here, it was too close for the forklift to turn. That's why he re received his red feedback. So on the left part, there is the exercise. One part is for the human eye, one part is for the camera. So they work 
you know, we put four lamps like that in a classroom, three or four apprentices per, per table. Once they are ready, they can run the simulation. So now you see the forklift, they pick the boxes in the shelves, in the trucks, and they bring into the shelves and vice versa. On the bottom, you have the performance of the warehouse, the average time to bring a box from the shelf to the truck, and so on. Do you think they will learn the logistic like, with doing this? So all kinds of activities. How to load the truck in the reverse order of deliveries while managing the center of gravity of the truck. Not so easy. Level slow. And finally, stock management, the most difficult. So, super cool. Super, they like it, they ask, sir, can we take a picture? Would we use it? And yet, when we did experiment comparing to paper, there was no learning. Because there is a time for telling. Because there was a need for the teacher to build on what they've done and say, why? Okay, you were was, was, faster, was faster than they were was. Okay, why? Uh, I'm the king. Yeah, but no, why? Uh, uh, I don't know. Well, let's compare. So on this dashboard of the teacher, every, every line, every row is one team. And this team has been designing six or five warehouses. And the teacher has a tool that helps him to manage a classroom and to, here you see the different warehouses. The color, yellow to red, was the amount of manipulation because the worst team was spending time playing and not this reflecting. And he can pick two warehouses, comparing the performance measure and asking them, why? Explain, compare, let me tell you. So there is this bridge, which is fun fundamental. The time for telling, it's easy to say, but you need to build the lecturing part on the top of what they produce. Otherwise, the meaning-making phase of exploring is not used for transferring this meaning to the content of the lecture. So that's another role of the system, the classroom as a system. We talk about monitoring, monitoring what they do when you are not lecturing you, or when you are lecturing, you need to monitor them. But the second one is debriefing, aggregating the production so that we can discuss them with you, with your students. So a last example. This is not my class, but my class looks a bit, a bit like that. I have an HCI class, Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock. And uh, it looks a bit like that. And um, um, so one, one of the activity I wanted to do is to teach them uh, the different interaction styles. So they have to order. I asked them to go online and to order four train tickets with this interface, which is a language command, with this one, which is a form, with this one, which is um, drag and drop, and with this one, which is a graphical uh, interface. Okay. My goal is to let them feel in themselves the pros and cons of different interaction style. I repeat, this is an HI class. So once they've done that, they can rank them, like which is your favorite um, interface. And, and then what happened? So I can describe my lesson like that. We start with a class of activity, my introduction. Then they individually order for 20 tickets. Then I ask them to argue about it. So here you see Ryan and Jenny, have both voted, have both ordered the preference. And I asked them to argue. It's a class of 200 people, they cannot move. So the system automatically generates 100 chats of two people who disagreed. So two people who gave different rank rankings on the individual activity. There is no more, no noise in the class. You just hear the noise of 200 keyboards. And, and so the systems, in many of my case, he tried to pick, that was another one, he picked, this is an opinion map of my students, and he picks people of a opposite opinion. And this was in 10 minutes, the chat between these pairs who were arguing. So next step, they've been arguing. And then I say, you know, I don't want you to argue whether you like or not an interface. 
HCI has to be data driven. Now here are the data. This is the average time to pro produce the first, second, and third train ticket with the four interface. Now, please argue again, not based off I like it or not, based on data. And uh, there again, they have to argue. And then at the, at the end, I do the debriefing activity. And you know, all these data are being always aggregated by the system. So this system is, is a workflow that takes elements in output from an activity and fits as an input the next activity. And that's a very important point of what I mean by a classroom is a system. My classroom is a workflow that gets data from an activity and provides data to the next activity. I have done the similar things without, without a computer, collecting pieces of paper. So I could do the workflow with paper when we have up to 25, 30 students, not with, two, not with 200. So that's another idea of the, of the classroom as a system. It's not only about monitoring, uh, but it's also supporting the difficult process. You know, the briefing requires improvisation. So we have to build in real time on what the students have produced. Not so many teachers like improvisation. If you choose a job that you know you will be a teacher all your life, and you know, not so many teachers like improvisation, this, this is challenging. And you need to be extremely self-confident, extremely comfortable with the domain to jump into a phase of debriefing improvisation based on what they have to produce. So it's very important if we want to be constructivist, if we want this time for telling approach, it's very important that the lecturing parts, we help teachers doing the lecturing part to, we aggregate for the teachers, the things he will need to do a, a good lecture at the end based on the production of the students. So, and then we use that for another thing. Let me pause the video just for a second. What do you do? You are probably all teaching at some point and you give them an exercise to your class and say, okay, Monsieur Dame, uh, I gave you 10 minutes for this thing. Then at uh, eight minutes, say two minutes left, one minute left, and then it's 10 minutes. And 80% have finished. What do you do? You give them one more minute, two more minutes, three more minutes. Well, if 20% are, are, have not finished, and if you jump to the next activity, you lose 20% of them. But don't forget that 80% waiting. And you know, when a student is waiting, doing nothing, it, he, he open his email or he, he do whatever. So you are maybe losing 80% for the 20%. So do you know, can we tell the teacher, no, based on what they have done, if you extend the duration by two minutes, you will get 10% more or 20% more. And that's what we have done in this, in this tool. So the blue is those who have started the exercise, the, green, the red those who have finished. And basically, when, as long as the slope is, is quite steep, you are fine. But, as, but when the slope is getting flat, it means you can wait longer. You will have no more people completing the activity because they drop out or they abandon or whatever. So that's another tool that helps the orchestration of activities where the students participate. It's simply a predictive timing. If you add one more minute, you will get one X more person completers. So you decide as a teacher, it does not decide for you. You decide as a teacher when, when you stop the activity because say, okay, I can't wait more time, but I will not improve anything. So uh, that's not what I wanted to do. So, um, so basically, uh, no, that's not what. So that's a new function of this um, of this classroom as a system. I talk about monitoring the state of the learners. And of course, monitoring aims to intervene to say, okay, you are why why are you stuck and so on. I talk about collecting, aggregating 
the students' production in order to um, support the debriefing phase. And the last point, another way, another use, usefulness, another use of collecting data is to help the teachers to do predictive timing, to say, okay, given what they've done so far, it's, it's a waste of time to, to wait longer. And all these functions have the same idea in mind. It's about orchestrating. It's about managing complex activity. If you have a PowerPoint, you don't need much orchestration tool. You just need to compare how many slides you have left and how much time you have left. But if you go for more constructivist approach or this kind of semi-constructivist, where there is an exploration phase and a lecturing phase, then um, it's more useful to have the classroom as a system, to view the classroom as a system. What is the system doing? The system is helping you to orchestrate, to manage in real time this classroom. And uh, I think I've been much too fast, but I think that's not a big problem, especially on a Friday af af evening. So that's it for me. Thank you, Pierre. So do we have questions? So you can ask questions and speak up um, if you didn't. <laughs> yeah, you have some class. Um, I'm, I'm copying the link again, just in case. So there is one question. Does uh, Benjamin want to ask it? Yeah, my pleasure. First of all, thanks again, Pierre, for the brilliant lecture. Uh, this rings very true to uh, to my heart and my own thoughts about pedagogy. I wanted to uh, ask an understanding question. You introduced these two phases of exploration and then debriefing. And I wondered if that is related to the creativity literature, uh, literature where they talk about divergent thinking to produce ideas and then convergent thinking to check which, which ideas actually work. Um, that's one way to phrase it. That that's a bit the difference between, um, for instance, the approaches of Dan Schwartz and Manu Capuso. So Dan Schwartz, this exploration phase, he will give them contrasted case. He would say, look at these two opposite cases and try to find out um, um, differences, and then the lecture comes later on. So there, we cannot really say it's divergent versus convergent. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the case of Manu, he say. Uh, he want to teach standard deviation, he tells them, listen, look at these four soccer players. These two guys, they, they all have the, the, tell me which one is the more consistent, okay? Uh, certainly not the French one. Uh, tell me which one is the more consistent. This is the number of goals they've scored every year over the last 10 years. Tell me, do whatever. And, but one trick in Manu's approach is to produce multiple solution, come with multiple ideas, not with one, come with two or three. So they, they don't know standard deviation. So they, they draw all kinds of sketch and so on and so on. At some point, one has a very, is, um, has a graph of the number of, of goals per year per student. And he say, oh, if I put a rope on this graph and I pull the rope, then the shortest rope will be the most consistent. So, you know, it never said, oh, Let's take the, the square root of the distance from the mean. Huh? Um, he said, um, you know, he said something like that. The kind of a pre-meaning was there. But then again, there is a time for telling. At some point, say, yes, let, mesdames et messieurs, this is called standard deviation. And now this is the way we, this is, thank you, you have not all discovered, but you kind of get it. And then, and then call it convergent phase or call it, Labeling, because at some point we know that when a concept receives a label, it, it's more fixed that the concept remain unlabeled. So, um, so but the main trick is is that yeah, in this predictive failure method of Manu, is really insisting on the divergence in the exploration phase, and 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 there's recently with Stan May Sina, one of his PhD, they recently. Um, made a very nice meta-analysis of all these methods and they go into these details. What do exactly, what do we mean when we do a meta-analysis? Because all these methods kind of belong to the same family. If you look at them from a behaviorist point of view, they're all the same. 
if you zoom a little bit and look them for from a more rigorous uh, uh, there there are still big difference like yeah yeah how much um, how much divergence or not there is in the first phase thank you very much okay okay thank you um i also want to, to ask a question like I, I like that the fact that you are you, you are an, an intermediate level between because like sometimes the, the, the edm community is more on the side of the student model and um, like the learning analytics community is more on the teacher side uh, a level with the metrics and here you are an, at intermediate level of groups right like uh, where you like to to have a group with people helping each other so i was wondering what kind of um, models of groups you would um, you, you you are thinking about because you mentioned the fact that indeed um the, the fact that uh, you may not want to like you have to decide between the 20 percent and the 80 percent but you could also decide to do a matching between the one that that completed with the one that didn't complete right and in your um, in your uh, framework you can uh, optimize these kind of things right so do, do would you recommend like uh, i don't know like um, helping the the average level or the minimum level of the class or um that's a very good idea. Do you have the patent on that? Because that's a very good idea. So automatically matching those who have not completed with some completers, to, that's a very good idea. I will patent it tonight uh, if you have not done it. Um, so I will start straight away. My, 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 you know, all, all my life has been about uh, collaborative learning. I remember one of the first AI in it was 90. Three, I think when I mentioned collaborative learning, people look at me as, what is this? I mean, the goal of is individual adaptation, why are you talking about teams and so on? Then it became a pandemic, like everybody went into collaborative learning at, to a point where, where I said, oh, wait just a minute, we, we still have an individual brain. It's still, uh, the hardware is individual, the, source, the software language is social, but the hardware is individual. So, so uh, what you've seen, what you have seen in, in this orchestration graph that I use is that I don't choose. So there is, a, for me, a rich lesson as individual activities, team activities, and class-wide activities, class-wide being lecturing. So I don't choose. I, I'm in favor of integrating and not separating these things. I mean, as scientists, we sometimes have a strong focus, but a teacher, for me, it's fine if the teacher is constructivist at nine o'clock, behaviorist at 9.30, social cultural guy at 9.45, neuro, neuro something at 10 o'clock. A teacher should borrow whatever he finds useful. And you point about EDM being, being more learner-centric and data analytic and learning analytics more teacher-centric. There is no way to, to be on one side. It's true that in digital education, we've neglected the teacher for many years. And Hati, I think, has found in his super, super meta-analysis, meta, 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 I think 30% of the learning gains are explained by the quality of the teacher. So we should really put the teacher in the loop and so on. But um, for many years, you know, the in the digital education world, there has been this slogan from a stage on the stage to a guide on the side. The teacher should not be there. He should be a facilitator on the side, which was very politically correct, but wrong. You cannot ask a teacher, that's his job. You cannot ask him to be on the side. And it is not backed up by the results from Ati that I mentioned. So the teacher as a role is not lecturing for 50 minutes, but the, the question is, how do we orchestrate a lesson where there is problem solving, where there is bits of lecture and so on, and, and um, which is a bit more difficult than just a lecture? And can we use technology to facilitate this richer scenario? Okay, th thank you very much. And by the way, the, the theme of this year, EDM, is indeed distance learning, blended and distance learning. So, um, OK. So um, there are other questions on the speak up. Uh, so um, some people ask you to, uh, to point out to, to the meta-analysis you're mentioning, if you can do it uh, in the chat or afterwards, because people are interested in the references. I think, um, 
Ja, okay. okay. Dann mir äh, dann mir Tina und Manu Kapoor, ich sitze an my desktop. Um, no. Um, But later is fine. We will share with the participants. And um, uh, there is someone asking a question about the goal, asking giving a goal to students. Do you want to? Um, does this person want to ask the question? Yeah, I was wondering if giving a goal to the students while they're using those virtual environments would help them understand the things better before the debriefing. So would giving them an activity such as identify the factors that are most likely going to make your system fail, uh, help them understand from the activity how it works? Uh, I didn't really understand the question, Jad. <laughs> So, the, for example, for the logistic things, they were kind yeah. of free. Do you think that asking them questions about understanding while they're playing uh, with the activity would help? I see. Uh, I did not explain that, but there was a goal. There was a goal on the, there was an instruction on the paper sheet they use. Uh, there was an instruction like this, this activity, you have to uh, optimize storage for large items or something like that. But um, we should refrain it's a trade-off we should put some structure put some goals so that they don't mess around completely like when manu told him you know which one is the most consistent that's a clear goal but we should not go too far into um structure them because that's the process of kind of failing trying messing a bit around that that um, that is important no on the other side, we know from all the education research that telling to the students what you expect them to have learned at the, if at the beginning of the lesson you tell the students what you expect them to have learned by the end of the lesson, they learn more. Uh, these are studies from the from the eighties. Um, so the question is, can you communicate this? If Manu comes and say, oh. I will teach you about standard deviation. The students will say, what is standard deviation? And the whole story is screwed up. <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah, informing them about the goals of the lesson helps to, when they receive fragments of information, they helps to integrate this fragment into uh, a meaning, meaningful structure. Thanks. Um, so, can the person who has the question about uh, practice debriefing le lecture? I, I can ask. Hi, Pierre. Uh, thank you for the fantastic talk. Uh, so, my question is, like this strategy of uh, first the practice and then the brief and then uh, lecture, would it work in different domains and different complexities? Like, have you uh, experimented on if it works better in teaching math versus language learning, or if in when you have very complex um, concepts to teach that need a lot of uh, prerequisites, would this work or the students just will be more confused if they want to try that? Um, it's a good question. The, the, in, in the meta-analysis by Kapoor and, and Tan Tanme, they, they consider whether there is a um, the, the, the where the result um, vary according to the field, the domain, like mathematics versus Latin versus whatever. If I remember, the answer is no. No, there are different topics, you know, um, different levels of complexity. Um, my colleagues from quantum physics, they tell me, Pierre, I cannot do that. I mean, it's, I cannot do that. I mean, it's too, too, too complicated. I really need to build, um, to build uh, step by step the conceptual graph that they need to master everything. Um, and since I cannot contradict them because I understand nothing in quantum physics, so I cannot uh, contradict. But, but, um, and then there are some domains where, uh, let's say, in terms of procedural skills. Um, maybe this approach is, is less effective than mastery learning. I know that mastery learning is very, and BKT is very popular in EDM, but maybe I can tell you a story that when I was, I was a school teacher in Brussels, 
41 years ago. <laughs> and um, first year teacher, 20 years old, 31 kids in my class. And, and um, I had to teach, uh, so eight, nine years old, so they learn uh, a written calculus. So addition, written addition, with subtraction, and so on and so on. And I decided, I decided, I don't know, I was uh, not risk aversive at that time. I decided to teach them how to count in base two, seven, 25, 13, 24, and so on. And then, and then how to add numbers in all these bases and so on. And, and, and I spent a lot of weeks doing that and I was getting very nervous about it. And then I moved into what I was supposed to teach. Uh, Written addition, written subtraction, written subtraction with borrowing, with borrowing of the borrowing and, and multiplication. And it went, it went like that. Because I spent, even if it was a procedural skills, I wasted several hours just letting them discover the basic mechanism of numbers being in columns and what it means to move a number between two columns. And then, um, out of the 31, 28 got all its, I mean, I completely got back, catch back the time I lost it because, so even maybe in procedural, in procedural skills, this, this method could apply. Um, usually, you know, when somebody asks me, it will not work in my domain. I, I reply, are you a mathematics teacher? That's always a mathematics teacher who asks. So are you a mathematics teacher? Uh, machine learning, AI, close. <laughs> no, 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 machine learning, you are closer to reality than mathematics. You know that there is a role, a real world outside. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> okay. Um, I also wanted to ask uh, whether, yeah, I, I enjoyed your uh, socio-cognitive conflict uh, example. I was wondering if you got inspired by uh, uh, Frank Silvestre works on set notes, like whenever you, you try to match the student with someone that disagrees with them to, to foster um, like a better con consolidating uh, your, your your thinking. Uh, I don't know this. Um, uh, I was, okay. so I was influenced by, hmm. I, I was in Geneva in the school of Piaget. And so there were the social constructivists to us and Muni who came out with a conflict, this notion of uh, social cognitive conflict. Um, were still professors there, so I was inspired by them. And when I had my colleague, who's still my colleague, Patrick Yerman, and I said, hey, Patrick, for the class tomorrow, I got an idea. He said, oh, no. I said, let's collect the opinion and let's make teams automatically based on opposite opinion that was all in PHP. And, and so that was 19, I think something like that. So um, that was um, um, directly from the source, from the original, Piagetian okay. children. Yeah, that, that's a yet another intervention that can uh, help uh, the, the crowd learn better than just uh, a single human. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have uh, other questions on the speaker? Or does it, people want to ask questions directly? There is Ken. Ken is supporting me in my, in my criticism against mathematics. <laughs> but but yeah, I well, you know, it, it is interesting, different epistemologies about learning. And uh, I, I'm, I'm you know, so many years we've been engaging in various kinds of learning by doing investigations like, you know, you know, there's a lot of debate within that, but there's a lot of agreement in this learning science community that some forms of learning by doing or active learning or even the testing effect, uh, uh, generation effect, uh, all these things, right? Collaborative, interactive, problem solving. Yet, somehow the transmission models of, you know, how learning works still seem to be pervasive amongst many maybe more fact maybe more university faculty than than k-12 teachers but but also students and i wonder what what do you think about that and how how do we make progress on helping people better understand how re learning really works um you don't have another question an easier question for me uh, <laughs> it, it's what, what did you have for breakfast <laughs> it's exactly uh, exactly my job as an associate vice president for education now to convince professors to 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 go there. Um, the 
I, I, I feel there is, a, there is an improvement. Um, some of them say, are you, you, you want, do, you, do you want to suppress lecturing on campus? I say, no. And I'm, I'm not worried, lecturing will never disappear. It's all part of a DNA and I lecture as well sometimes. And um, so how do we convey this, this um, constructivist ideas? I, I don't know. I've seen my kids coming back from school and you see the sheet of paper that was given by the teacher and that was designed by some constructivist. You understand that it was designed by the constructivist uh, designer, but that teacher all the kids, please color, <laughs> color the things, in, <laughs> and you know, but that's not the point, and so on. So, um, yeah, teacher training, better teacher training is the only is the only um, is the only answer I can say. And at university level, teacher teacher training is minimal, so it's it's accompanying the teachers um, to do so, but. Um, at least one point is to recognize that it's difficult. This, this, this open stuff, when you let them explore, and then at some point, you don't want to have a messy class, you let them explore for a while, and then I say, I need to, that's difficult. And, um, and maybe these tools that aggregate the individual production into one snapshot, that's something that might help teachers to move into the into this a bit more, it's a bit more risky as a pedagogy than, than, than going through your PowerPoint. What is the flag behind you? Oh, that, that's a carryover from our last presidential election. It's a okay. Biden flag. Yeah. yeah, I'm in my backyard. We got that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, do we have any more questions? By the way, yeah, actually, you can ask you uh, what you had for breakfast as an easier question. Uh, ask me um, what will happen at six o'clock Belgian Italy and at nine o'clock Switzerland. Um, Spain, yeah, as, as I have both passports, um, but I can tell you something that EDM cannot beat. I have, I have somebody who is 10 times better than any EDM person. You know, France, Switzerland was on Monday and there was no way Switzerland could win. But on Monday at 10 o'clock, so 10 hours before the match, one guy in my lab said, today, after 90 minutes, it will be equal, which nobody would predict. After the time extension, it will be equal. And then there will be, there will be penalty and Mbappé will miss his penalty. He said that 10 hours, and that was exactly what happened. So, so this guy, I think you should, you should extract his brain and try to find which kind of neuronal patterns he has, because that should inspire deep learning algorithms for, for the next generation of the people. I have seen a really long thread on Twitter that said that Mbappé didn't miss their penalties. The penalty was good, but uh, the, the defense was excellent. But that was a French Twitter. Yeah, yes, but I guess when you are the world champion, everyone wants to destroy you. So that's, <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's the game. Okay. <laughs> this is the new octopus, right? That was predicting before. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Good. So, thank you. Do we want to have more discussion or are we closing out? Sorry. Uh, you, of course, feel free to discuss. And um, yes, there, there are just... Uh, uh, how much time do we have? How much time do we have, Jim? Uh, yes, uh, we, we do have time. Uh, okay. As much time as you want, yes. It's, uh... Yeah, I, I guess um, going back to orchestration, Pierre, uh, is, uh, and, and, you know, maybe also around this question of how to foster learning by doing there there are there are a lot of different options for doing it and and i wonder like the orchestration is feedback the data feedback is providing information to evaluate how things are going um do you also see a role for for uh you know guidance in terms of what options to choose from as i reflect on that data coming back as a teacher you know how how are there ways in which I can respond or 
or maybe decide to try something different? Mm, no, we, I think we should, we should not, uh, that would be almost unskilling the teacher. Um, so it's not only telling the teacher what's going on, but it's also um, what I suggested is, you know, aggregate, aggregating uh, what the students have been, um, have been, have been produced so that he can build this mini lecture based on what they've produced. But um, anything like any kind of recommendation from the system and saying, no, we suggest you do that. No, you suggest we do that. Might be okay for as a teacher training tool. Might be okay as a prosthesis for teachers who fail to manage it, who I know, clearly that doesn't work and maybe that's the kind of prosthesis they need. But my, 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 you know, even in, in these things I, sh I showed, okay, you showing to the teacher a map of where he has been and not been in the classroom. Mm -hmm. We could do the same with eye tracking, showing him a map of which kids he has been paying attention to or not. Mm -hmm. A good teacher should, should distribute attention, not evenly, but should not, you know, sometimes some teachers say, oh, this kid, there is nothing to expect from him. And this kid is, is, is condemned. He will, you know, if you have no expectation from the teacher, there will be no learning. So, so a very simple tool saying, this is a heat map of which kids we've been looking at the most during this week. You can remember who you've been looking at for the last 10 minutes, but not over a week. Or oh, this is a heat map of where you've been and not been. Did you notice you never look, go in the corner of the little Jade because you know Jade is such a bad student that you, you don't even expect anything from her. And, and I would not give any feedback. I would not write, please pay attention to the students that you have neglected. I would say, this is the map. You are a human being. Uh, you, you just, we just make you aware, of, show you what was happening, but it's your job as a teacher. You are the boss, you are the driver, you are responsible. It's your job to, to, to analyze this and to take, to take the information. My, my suggestion was actually to print this map on a label on a white bottle. So on a Friday evening, every teacher will receive a wine bottle with a map of where he has been and not been. So it's not a pedagogical blah, blah. They say, let's meet the pedagogical advisor and he will tell, you know. No, it's a, uh, oh, oh, this week, I, again, I neglected the students and okay, next week, um, I will pay attention, something like that. So it's not doing too much interpretation. Let the teacher be the boss. Let the teacher be the driver, just provide kind of minimal, things, but not step on his toes. So follow up to that. If the, um, if the tool as you straw man it is useful, potentially as a teacher training tool, what's the, what's the difference here? Like, is that you suggesting that the platform that only gives information and allows the, the teacher to construct the meaning out of it is only built for instructors who are already skilled and then there's just some completely different design that's for a different population of, of teachers that might include some promotion of pedagogical ideas no I, I mean they're not two different tools imagine the same let's say heat map of the classroom of the classroom presence you could have this 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 tool without without recommender Result with or with a recommendation. So a novice teacher would maybe receive a recommendation that that uh, can suggest it. Maybe you should do that now. And then you know any prosthesis. You know if, if you if you get a buoy to learn to swim, that's fine. But if you never remove the buoy, you will never be able to swim. So any prosthesis needs to fade out. So this recommend the part would be um, okay as a, as a training tool and then should be progressively removed as, as the teacher is more skilled. Uh, and this recommended part can be 
a system or another person. It can be the the school director or the colleague that say, if you look at this, what do you think about it, and so on and so on. So the the the, the filling out will be automatic when you are in, in the teaching training phase. Somebody is looking at this map with you. Once you are fully in your job, yeah, it's your own duty to do it. Uh, but again, I have this vision of making tools minimalist. I have to take this one here. Uh, we could display the exact waiting time. What we have done, and we could say, we could have, a, you know, Pierre exercise five, 10 minutes waiting for 20 seconds. And in some way, we, we reduce the quality of information. Like here, you don't know uh, how much time exactly I've been working, but less than here. So we kind of make the information less precise, more in the background. The teacher doesn't spend his time looking at a lantern. So I think when we talk to tools for the teacher, we should be minimalist. Small things, light things can have a big effect, Every, especially everything that bring the teacher to reflect a little bit on his own practice can have a big effect. We don't need to be, to make two smart tools. These tools are not, this tool is not smart, but the wasted time was passed from 62 to six persons. So without any intelligence in the tool. So I would be careful not to make, to introduce tools that disempower the teacher. I think we should leave the teacher driving, driving the class. And, and this is not conservatism. I'm not saying that the teacher should be the student or should be lecturing all the day, but um, yeah, the teacher is, is the driver in, in, in a good lesson. He believes his passion, he convinces and so on and so on. Okay, thank you very much for all for this uh, discussion. Um, maybe it's time to wrap up the session. So thank you very much, Pierre, for being with us uh, today. My pleasure. Yes. And um, okay, so uh, I, I sent in the chat the fact that uh, you have yes, you, you can all <laughs> you can open your mic if you want. Congratulate our speaker. And um, so see you at uh, six p.m. in the same this same room for um, the Test of Time Award that will be presented by Ken Koedinger. And um, otherwise, there is also a crepe party um, coming up in the Zoom too. So I, I also share the link. So yes, yeah, so we wish we, we could have you in uh, Paris today. So that's why we make crepe. Okay. Thank you very much to all. <laughs> Thank you.